it's so awful when someone comes and says you're sorry when they mean you're better. Gwen, move your chair up so I can see you. Yeah. Yeah. Each other. Um, you not so much, but Gwen. Okay. I, well, I can't see them either. I'm looking. There we go. David's firm, it's New Space Global, right? This firm is, no, it's quite different. Um, I'll look it up. I'll have it on my face the way I'm looking right now. Yeah, it is New Space Global. It is new space board. Is that what it's called? Yeah. That's why I couldn't remember either. It's one of these yeah. sort of non-memorable names. I just do try to remember the... Um, I was so disappointed that we didn't go in there. I was so disappointed. Yeah. Um, and that was the reason, one of the reasons I still going and thought, you know, 100 years later, because yeah. I know how yeah. to do this. They went back oh, by the way, the you're doing this conference with Leslie Smaller. I'm so sad I can't come. Oh, okay. Up in, at MIT? No, Up in Boston? The one at UCSD. Oh, yeah. The, oh, okay. That looks the so national looks space. so great that I... Anyway, I sent you my chart, which isn't okay. that good. I'm going to explain everything that's wrong with it today.
Good afternoon. Welcome as we explore space exploration today and how private industry is taking a much more prominent role. Uh, we are very honored, or I'm very honored, I think we're all honored to have uh, four very distinguished panelists uh, with us today. On my far left is Gwen Shotwell. Glenn was raised in the Chicago area. Uh, in the third grade, she became very curious about how a car engine worked. So her mother bought her a book. And, uh, and she used that curiosity uh, as she went through school as a straight A student in high school and decided to go to Northwestern where she got a bachelor's and a master's degree in mechanical engineering and applied mathematics. It was better to get it in two than in just one subject, obviously. Um, <laughs> Uh, Gwen was one of three women in a class of 36 mechanical engineering undergraduates. Uh, after uh, school, she did various things, but eventually went to work at Aerospace Corporation, where she was for 10 years. And eventually, she met uh, Elon Musk and uh, came to SpaceX as a vice president of business development. She was their seventh employee in 2002. And I think on the way over here, you told me you now have 3,000 employees. Yeah, just over 3,000. Right. So. They found out that Gwen had gone there and everybody wanted to go <laughs> to work there. Um, uh, SpaceX has been profitable since uh, 2007 and in 2008 Gwen became the president and the chief operating officer of SpaceX Corporation. Uh, to my left here is Lieutenant General Ellen Polakowski. Uh, General Polakowski is responsible today for more than 2,000 employees nationwide as she is the commander of the Space and Missile Systems Center at a Air Force Base in Los Angeles. Uh, General Polakowski was a little late getting here today because she's not used to traveling on our surface street. She likes to travel by air. <laughs> and she had a rude awakening as uh, when you travel around Los Angeles, it's not like traveling around in space. Uh, the budget uh, of the center under her command is $10 billion today. She manages the research, design, development, acquisition, and sustain sustainment of satellites. Um, she herself uh, first got involved in the Air Force when she was in college at the New Jersey Institute of Technology and joined the ROTC after college where she got her uh, degree in chemical engineering. She went on to the University of California, Berkeley. Go Bears! I went to Cal. And uh, she will get to Stanford here in a minute. Um, and she received a PhD in chemical engineering from the University of California, Berkeley. And she will tell us in a minute why she decided to go into the military rather than the private sector. Uh, to my right is May Jemison. Uh, May is the only person up here on the panel today who has actually been in space as an astronaut. Uh, May grew up in Chicago, and she entered Stanford at the age of 16, because Stanford doesn't have enough people older than 16, so <laughs> they had to bring in people at 16. Uh, she came there on a National Achievement Scholarship. She graduated Stanford with a degree in chemical engineering, as well as completing coursework in African and African American studies. Uh, from Stanford, she went on to Cornell Medical School, where she got her medical degree and became a doctor. Uh, she did her internship and in some general practicing here in Los Angeles. Uh, and then she joined the Peace Corps and worked as a doctor in West Africa and Sierra Leone and Liberia. From 1987 to 1993, uh, she served NASA as an astronaut. May was the first woman of color to go into space in 1992, going to the space lab aboard the Endeavor. Since then, she started two technology companies, has taught environmental st studies at Dartmouth, is working on sustainable technology and development, and founded the Dorothy Jemison Foundation, named for her mother, for excellence with educational pro uh, programs and science literacy for, for uh, young people. She's in the National Women's Hall of Fame, and this is only just a little bit about <laughs> May here. I'm very intimidated and very say, it's okay, you went to Stanford, it's all right, so. <laughs> Say anything. Okay. Later. Okay. <laughs> For a little bit over the last year, May's been involved with a hundred year starship, a nonprofit which received uh, seed funding from DARPA, which is part of the Defense Department, and a hundred space a uh, hundred year starship is to ensure space exploration goes on to benefit the planet. 
by promoting research and make sure we have the capacity and capability to travel in space. And to my far right is Esther Dyson. Esther was born in Zurich, Switzerland. Her father was a physicist and a futurist writer, and her mother was a prominent mathematician. Uh, so um, Esther was exposed to things related to space when she was very young, but really didn't have an interest at it at the time. Well, I took it for granted. It wasn't that I wasn't interested, okay. but I didn't think I needed to be involved. I thought it would happen anyway. Okay, and we'll learn why you changed your mind. Yes. Um, uh, Esther entered Harvard at 16. Everybody to my right entered college at 16. Everyone to my left entered college probably at the same age the that normal I time. did. Yeah. At the normal yeah. time, basically. Uh, but, uh, and Esther was very interested actually in journalism when she was at school and was involved with the Harvard, Harvard Crimson. Out of school, she became a fact checker and a reporter for Forbes magazine. She went on to Wall Street and became a security analyst specializing in electronics and technology. And in 1980, founded ED Venture Holdings, an information technology and new media company. She's been investing in technology and in the internet for a number of years. And in the last several years has become more interested in the area of space and has also been an investor in space adventures and x -Core Aerospace, among other companies. Um, Esther, uh, when I say she became interested in space in 2008-2009, uh, she trained as a backup cosmonaut at Star City outside of Moscow uh, and experienced weightlessness and did not make it into space, but certainly went through all the training. So we have quite a distinguished panel here as we go into this subject, a subject that's always fascinated me as I used to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and watch the Mercury uh, uh, flights into space, which probably none of you even remember. Uh, but, you know, space has been very interesting. In 1961, in April 1961, Yuri Gagarin became the first man into space as a Russian cosmonaut, and he was up there for 108 minutes. Alan Shepard was the first American in space, a month later, in May of 61, and he was only in space for 15 minutes. But he went on 12 years later to walk on the moon. 12 men have walked on the moon. There have been over 110 shuttle launches. 530 people have gone into space. Uh, the first woman went into space in June 1963, Valentina Tereshkova. Uh, and the first woman, American woman in space was not Sally Ride until June of 1983. There have been 51 women into space, including May, uh, and she was the 18th woman uh, that went into space as on, on the shuttle, as I mentioned earlier. It's interesting to me that the farthest we've ever gone into space is the moon, and nobody has been on the moon since 1972. So it's been over 40 years. Um, there's been a big change, though, in the way we explore space and the way industry and government work. And before I go on with the panelists, we're going to show you a short video. With the shuttle era over, American spaceflight is on the verge of going private for the immediate future. It makes no sense for a large government bureaucracy to be building rockets. The private sector can do it much better. They can do it competitively. They can do it quickly. And that's what you see happening in the US with x -Corps and SpaceX and Blue Origin. SpaceX is one of a handful of companies with contracts to fly missions to the space station under NASA's $1 billion commercial crew and cargo program. Gwen Shotwell, the president at SpaceX, walked me through the factory. Here they are aiming for the holy grail, a fully and rapidly reusable rocket. It would revolutionize access to space. These engines actually are reusable. They are. Absolutely. How many flights can you get? Uh, I know we've tested a 20. He's now had seven space tourists actually go up to the space station. And you, you want to be a space tourist as well? Yeah, I'd love to be. Why? I, I want to be up there and, and look out. I want to experience it. I want to see the Earth from far away. And I want to help this thing happen because I think 20 years, 50 or 100 years from now, we'll be very glad that we moved beyond Earth to Mars and asteroids and, and wherever. Humanity and our planet stand at an inflection point. At 100-year Starship, 
we are calling on members of our generations to complete a clear mission. Make the capabilities for human travel to another star a reality within the next 100 years. Because just as past exploration pushed breakthroughs in agriculture, communications, energy, transportation, materials, and medicine, the greatest rewards of interstellar travel will be felt here at home. We believe that pursuing an extraordinary tomorrow will create a better world today. And who participates makes all the difference. Join us on this audacious journey. We'll discover a better version of ourselves and bring a brighter, more harmonious, more sustainable life to the future generations who will call our beautiful blue planet their home. So as we delve into the topic, um, General, tell us how space has changed the way the military operates today and what changes have gone on uh, just in how we use it uh, the way maybe versus 10 or 20 years ago? Well, you know, I've been in the Air Force now for about 30, 30 years. I, I was 17 when I went to college, so I, I guess I'm, I'm <laughs> okay, one of so. the, the remedial the members one. of the panel. But, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and in those, um, in those 30 years, I've been largely involved in managing technical programs. Um, I've only gotten involved in the space business um, since about 2004. Uh, but a, a common tr um, theme among, if you look back through my career, which I hadn't really thought about um, as I was doing it, is largely the, the focus has been in learning how to apply new technologies in order to essentially save lives. You know, we, we think about technology in defense in terms of better military power, but when you look back, uh, particularly with the space contribution to uh, military operations, national security operations, it has been a huge contributor to enabling us to be more effective with putting less lives at risk and less damage collateral damage in terms of affecting what we want to do. So when we first started out using space um, for national security, it was largely focused on um, reconnaissance types of things like weather satellites, because weather um, is something that is most easily observed from space, then on the ground you can get the global picture. Then it expanded into communications. And then it was in about 1984 when we made, I think, what was the most significant breakthrough when it comes to the use of space, the application of space in national security. And then this has eventually grown to a global effect, and that's the global positioning system. Now, I'd venture that everybody in this room today mm -hmm. has used GPS. And it wasn't just to try to navigate the streets um, mm -hmm. from here to wherever you are. Everything from your ATM um, transaction relies on the GPS satellites for the, for the timing. So now, today, when you look at any military operation, whether it's fighting um, Taliban in the mountains of Afghanistan or it's providing um, aid to tsunami victims, what you will find is that we cannot do it without our space pro without our space systems, whether it's GPS to figure out where we are, satellite communication in order to communicate, or it's um, uh, overhead imagery, or it's weather. All of those things are an integral part of the way we do we do operations today, the way we we save lives. And the interesting thing for me is in the basically the decade that I've been involved in space, is to watch how what was largely then predominantly something that was m contributed to the military, and there was the exploration part. But now, when you look at space today, it is a vital part of our economy. It isn't just uh, security operations. And, and in the process of doing that, we grew from being space capability that was largely government focused, government invested, to one where now there is a, just a huge growth 
in commercial investment and commercial opportunities right. in space. In particular, you know, Gwen and I have gotten to know each other over the, over the last three years in terms of space transportation which is a huge growth area that, that is leveraging the fact that people want to get to space. Right. And, and so for me, what I have seen happen in space over the last five years is much like what happened in the aircraft industry in the late 20s, 1920s, and 1930s, where it was largely a defense-focused industry, and now, today, just as with the aircraft then, it has expanded into the commercial market in many, many ways that most of us don't even think about. So there's huge opportunities in space. Right. So uh, Esther, you heard General talk about uh, her analogy to the aircraft industry. Now you used to invest in technology and the internet. So how did you transition into your interest in space? Okay, and, and I actually still do. But I got tired of helping rich white guys share videos and wanted, <laughs> wanted to do something more, well, number one, not redundant, that was not already being done. And I saw the transition beginning to occur that I'd seen earlier from DARPA, which was Defense Advanced Research Project. The DARPA net beta became the commercial internet. And a lot of people thought that was really sleazy, using the holy internet for commercial messages. And similarly, I saw the transition from mainframes to toy computers, which of course became PCs and now tablets. And both of these things changed commercial history. They, they, far out, they far exceeded anybody's initial expectations of what would happen when you made things smaller, cheaper, faster, uh, unleashed commercial energies, did disgusting things like putting logos on spaceships of I love this stuff, but it <laughs> offends some people. So I got interested in that. I invested in Space Adventures and a bunch of other companies. I had a conference for a couple of years called Flight School that was for new space startups. It was premature and died, but then I went to, I did my space training, I came back, I joined the NASA Advisory Council for two years, which unfortunately benefited me much more than it benefited NASA, but it, it gave me further education. And what I want to show right now is a chart, uh, which is number eight. And this is a chart that I had never seen. It's, it's release 0.9. It's, there's some mistakes on it, it's not perfect, but this is the first chart I've seen that actually looks at this as a market. The companies are not comparable. These are bananas and oranges and, and grapes, but at least they're all fruit. And you can see <laughs> behind you, <laughs> the, the bottom axis is time, the vertical axis is basically quantum distance from the Earth. And there's a lot going on. If you're an investor, you investors like this sort of clarity until now the new space industry has been pretty obscure. It's, you know, Elon, to his great credit, hired somebody from outside who had industrial experience. But a lot of these companies are still very obscure, run by billionaires, not necessarily that well managed. Technically, they're brilliant, but they're, they don't have the business skills that are going to be needed to make this a real industry. Now, that's changing. This morning, I had breakfast with a guy called Richard David who runs New Space Global, which is a startup new space industry analysis firm. If anybody wants to invest, I'm not being paid, but you should talk to them because they probably have an even better chart than this, but I didn't get it in time. The point of this all, though, is we're on the verge of this becoming a much more transparent industry where investors can ask rude questions like, what's your business model? Are you funded? How do you compare to the competition? What's your break even, your cash flow? And that, I think, is going to make a huge difference over the next year. SpaceX is, is clearly leading the way, and the, the kind of nasty stuff I said does not apply to SpaceX. But <laughs> it's, and 
God bless them, they are making this industry look real for everybody else. But they need good competitors for everybody to succeed. And more later. But okay. That's it. All right. So, Gwen, what's your business model? Are you cash flow positive? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've heard you say you work with for the coolest company on earth. Tell me a little bit about you know your transition and how you got to SpaceX and, and what is it, it what is it today? Sure. So let me, let me start with the the company specifically. Um, it, it is great to have great ideas and to have vision, but it's critical to turn that vision into reality, and you do that through uh, good business practices and solid business background. Uh, and we at SpaceX have had the benefit of having both great technologists, uh, the best, or the probably the, the best visionary ever, my boss, Elon Musk, and he's not paying me to say that, um, as well as a really astute business team. Um, so we have focused on developing the most advanced space transportation systems for the lay people. Those are rockets and spaceships. Um, but we're, and, and our ultimate goal is to make uh, humans capable of traveling interplanetary. Um, but, but Mars doesn't pay right now. Uh, what does pay? Uh, servicing the International Space Station with cargo and soon to be crew exchange. Uh, what else pays? Satellite delivery to orbit pays enormously. It's like a six billion dollar a year market. Um, so we've been able to structure the technology and to develop the systems such that we can leverage this existing market and then eventually exploit that technology in brand new markets like taking folks to Mars. Um, you asked about how I got into space. Um, I, uh, I actually, it, it was pretty serendipitous. I was getting my, ma actually I was getting my PhD, um, but considering transitioning away from a PhD and leaving with a master's degree, and I ran into a professor from my undergrad. And he said, oh, you know, we really need women engineers out in Los Angeles. You want to move to LA? And I thought, it was Chicago. It was winter. I said, yeah, I'll move to LA. And so I got hired at the Aerospace Corporation, which is actually a, like a large consulting firm for General Polakowski in the Air Force. Um, and I spent a decade there and learned as much as I could from the really the brilliant technologists and engineers that were there. Then I really wanted to go out and try to make space uh, more accessible uh, for, for the everyday person. Uh, and uh, I do recall when I, when I decided to join SpaceX, I said, this will be my last job in this industry. Because uh, if SpaceX can't make it work, I'd probably rather go sell real estate. <laughs> so I got lucky. I did not have to go back on that <laughs> promise to myself. Yeah. And I don't want to get too personal, but how old were you when you started college? I was 18. I was the dumb one. <laughs> I actually had to do some math. Like, how, was I really? I was really 18. So, Full blown 18. I want you. I feel much better now, though, <laughs> that I wasn't the only one. Now, on the video, they talked about the Holy Grail. I think was what the the person that was interviewing talked about is the reusable space rocket. So, how has that changed? Because it basically what we used to do is we sent satellites into space, and then the rockets crashed into the ocean, and we collected them, and that was it. So still the way we do it. Still the oh, way we do no. it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. So as I was talking about leveraging your technology as well as your business, what's important is to look at how you're going to get where you're going and apply the, both the technology and the business uh, necessary to do that. So it's, it's not financially very viable. Uh, look at the airline industry. If you used an airplane once, we probably wouldn't be flying as often as we flew. I mean, the, the concept is actually stupid. Um, so what we're trying to do is figure out a way to make rockets reusable because right now they're they're expendable. The shuttle was partially reusable. It was more refurbishable. They brought it back from a mission. Um, they dug some of the stuff out, uh, the SRBs they pulled out of the ocean, uh, and, and they exchanged a lot of components on the shuttle. So it wasn't as reusable as, as most folks think. What we are looking at is complete and rapid reusability. And I think on my video I have a, a shot of uh, our technology program called Grasshopper, which is where we're trying to um, understand the flight dynamics associated with a long cylinder, a rocket body, a rocket stage, and how it will behave uh, upon reentry and landing as well. Now we've made the Dragon capsule reenter from, from space, but it's, it's shaped like reentering bodies are supposed to be shaped. Uh, rocket stages are not that way. Um, so we're, uh, this project called Grasshopper is really interesting. We did a little baby hops, and then we did medium-sized hops, and then last week we went about 820 feet. Uh, up in the air, um, we're testing our guidance systems, our uh, our GNNC or our, our, our technology, the the altimeters, um, software, 
uh, and we'll keep going higher and higher with that grasshopper program until we get to the point where we can uh, bring the first stage back uh, from its uh, from its mission and uh, land it basically on a helipad and uh, push it over to the launch deck and uh, and light it up at about three hours later. That's the plan. Can I add sure. something just quickly? Please. One of the things that Gwen didn't highlight about, one of the values of the reusable, is there is a lot of cost in infrastructure to do a launch. Mm -hmm. And part of the cost is associated with you don't want, is, is having a rocket that goes astray and hits something that, like a schoolhouse, is not a good thing for any of us. And when these rockets go off, there isn't any control on them. And so part of the value of the reusable is, as Gwen said, it comes back and it lands on the, heli on the heliport, which means less infrastructure costs, lower cost to launch. So it's, it's not just the cost of the rocket that drives you to want to use a reusable um, engine, but it's the cost, the whole infrastructure associated with launch that can be driven down to a lower cost if we can technically do this. Plus from a reliability perspective, yeah. if you're bringing that asset back after its mission, you can look at the structural integrity, you can examine how it behaved during that mission. And I think you can drive in a lot of reliability features by reusing yeah. the capability. Excellent. And you just learn more by And you learn more about the system. Yes. Right, it's, of course. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, May, you're the only one up here that's actually been into space. You know, it, it's sort of interesting, as I talked about your, your history, um, you went from uh, an engineering degree to medicine, to practicing medicine. What got you involved, and, and tell us about what you're doing today. So, the reason I'm involved in space is really, really easy, because as a little girl growing up, I wanted to go into space. Notice I didn't say I wanted to be an astronaut, I wanted to go into space. And that's partly because when I was growing up, I was assumed that by the time we got to the point I was old enough to be there, we'd be going to Mars. We'd be doing something very, very differently because we were making those kinds of rapid uh, advances. So my career in terms of going in engineering, um, going to medicine, doing environmental sciences as a professor, really sort of reflects all the kinds of things that are needed whenever we send humans into space. It reflects those kinds of things. Very often we've been talking so far about the vehicle, about the ignition, about the launch sequence, but one of the things that has to be incorporated in the kinds of, of things that SpaceX is doing and other people's doing is how do you take care of humans when you're there? So there's one type of vehicle that you use when you're sending up a payload that does not have living systems on it. There's a whole other thing you need to do when you have living systems on it. So my contribution where I want to start right now is to talk about what I'm doing now. I'm doing a project called 100 Year Starship, as you heard, and it was seed funded by DARPA. Um, I led the team that won the competitive grant for it, and it's to make sure that we have the capabilities of sending humans to another star within the next 100 years. Notice I say capabilities. Our task is not to plan a mission but to make sure some kind of way that the capabilities exist, and they exist over a range of things. So let me tell the story a little bit differently. I didn't know they were going to have the video there, but let me tell the story a little bit differently. I'd like to start with slide 11. So the way we're looking at this and the way I see space exploration is that we actually believe in a better future. There is a better future for us. The next slide. We're inspiring an inclusive, collective <coughs> ambition for humanity. We need something different to think about. We need to look at the world differently. Humans need an adrenaline rush of some kind. Let's find a different one. The next slide tells you that we're really on a mission to achieve human interstellar flight capabilities and within the next 100 years. Why in the next 100 years? Because it's a time frame that's short enough in one way that we can sort of get a handle on it. We know organizations have lived for 100 years, right? But at the same time, it was probably a little bit as far enough in the future that it's a possibility. And in the next slide, what I really want to boil down to is that what this journey is about, it's designed to enhance life here on Earth. This isn't about going to another star, per se. It's about how the capabilities that come with sending humans to another star actually impact the Earth very, very positively. And we get to use them. And we want to make sure it's not a happenstance use, that it's applied purposefully. Why do we know this is important? I'm going to go to the next slide and just 
take a quote from the last person who was on the moon. Eugene Cernan said, we went to explore the moon, but in fact, we discovered the Earth. And if we go to the next slide, the question I would ask then is, what will we discover from another star? That is the context in which to take this and the perspective. What will we discover as we start to push ourselves in what we consider as a grand challenge? I'm going to just put the whole idea of going to another star in context. If you go to the next slide, here's the context. Why is it so much, so much more difficult than the things we're doing now? I'm going to go out on a limb and say, we know how to go to the moon. We know how to go to the moon. We really do. We can refine it. We can do a better job of it. But we really know how to go to the moon. We pretty much know how to go to Mars. We could do it better. We can change the engines. There are some little sticky wickets in there. But I don't think there's anything in there that we couldn't sit here on the stage, probably the ones of us on the stage right now, and sort of figure it out if we had the money yeah, and get the going. technology, right? She's <laughs> not looking at me, by the way. She's <laughs> looking at the other <laughs> panel. <laughs> so we could do that. So what, what makes going to another star di so different? The first thing that comes with that is the distance and the time that it takes. So if we think about our closest companion, the, the closest star system to us is over four light years away. That's the distance that light travels over six trillion miles in one year. The light from the sun takes eight minutes to get to us. So it's a long way away. The furthest object that humans have made from us is Voyager 1. It's outside of our, just went outside of our solar system. People are sort of saying, is it really? But let's just like, we're here in Los Angeles right now. Assume that Alpha Centauri, our closest star system, is in New York City. Voyager, which has been traveling at about 35,000 miles per hour since 1977, has gone about one mile. It would take 70,000 years to get to another star if we do it the way we're doing it today. Mm -hmm. So it means that you have to change things. That's the problem. So we have to look at new energy systems, right? Because you have to go much faster. And even if you were able to bring the, say, you could get there in 10 years or 50 years, once you get in between stars, you still have to generate energy in a different way. You have to generate and store in incredible quantities of energy. You're taking humans along. So all of a sudden, you have to understand what kind of closed environmental life support system you really need to carry with you. We don't really know how to do that. We really don't have good closed environmental life support systems. We have to take our microbial environment with us. Because right now, sitting in your chairs, you're bathed in microbes. And they're helping you out. If you didn't have them, you would not do as well. That's required for agriculture. We have to learn so much about that in order to be able to make that happen. And then finally, imagine if you figured all this out, we got the big ship, we worked with SpaceX, we got it going on, we've got it going. But you don't understand human behavior. So we really have to pay attention to human behavior. Otherwise, you'll never get there. The enabling things with the finance, education, um, sociocultural kinds of issues, all of those things are a part of this. That's the reason why 100-year starship is, was considered a grand challenge. And I'm just going to flip really quickly to um, the, the next slide, the grand challenge is something that's difficult but engages the imagination. There's so many things that we have to do, but people have been involved with space exploration for thousands of years. This concept of going to another star system, we go to the next slide, is kind of tough, but it's no more difficult than when people asked, when H.G. Wells wrote First Man on the Moon in 1901, it was less than 70 years later when we sent a human to the moon. And right now, our technological arch arc is much steeper. In fact, as I've started this project over the past year, I've learned so much more about where we really are that I'm thinking like piece of cake with having the capabilities, <laughs> right, knowing how to do this. And then as I want to go finally on, I want to make another point going to the uh, next slide. Julius Nyerere, who was the first president of Tanzania, said during the Apollo program, while they were trying to reach the moon, we were trying to reach the village. And with 100-year starship, we're trying to do both. And in fact, it's very clear that everything that we need in order to be successful with a human mission to another star is what we need to survive successfully on this planet as a species. What we think about when we look at this 
is that space exploration is something that's been with us for years. There's a, there's a business perspective, there's the technologies that come out of it. But if you think about it, we all used to look up at the stars, every society, every civilization, each one of us, and we wondered what it was. It engaged our imagination. Right? It was one of our first technologies. And so I think this is one of those, not just a continuation of the journey, but it's the sort of kind of advancement and the progress that we need to make. So when I look at 100 Year Starship, it's really about how do we continue on as a species. And my task, our task, is to be able to keep it moving so that we don't keep stutter stepping, that it's not 40 years between the time we do big and bold things. Interesting. So. If it's going to take a hundred years before we go to Mars, um, I know no, no, that like stars, oh. another star. It's not going to take a hundred years. Mars is well, I was just going to concern because I know you want to Gwen's go there. Going next year. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. But it's not a hundred years to do it within a yeah. hundred years. If you can do it faster, right? We can right. do it faster, yeah. right? Right. Right. So, so I mean, you you indicated um, you know on on the video that yeah. you have you have an interest. In, yeah. in going to Mars. Personally, I want to retire on Mars, Mars. but not too soon. Okay. <laughs> so. The, I, for what it's worth, I met with the guy who runs Mars One, who's a, a, a Dutch guy, and to be candid, I was not, ex I was expecting, you know, one of these space nut types. There's a lot of them, but I was very impressed. He's he's an engineer. He knows what he's doing. He's got a medical co-partner who understands, because as May said, a lot of the issues are, you're putting a human body in a box, maybe only for seven months, but. Somebody who's serious understands that they need to have a lot of medical expertise as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so, do I think he's going to make his his goal of 2020? I'm not sure. Uh, and then there's Dennis Tito as well with Inspiration Mars. But it is we've got stuff on Mars. Getting people on Mars is a little more complicated, and then they're going to have to bring a lot of camping supplies. But it's it's the kind of it's a prelude to what May is doing and the the other interesting thing we haven't mentioned at all is synthetic biology because if we do want to live on Mars and we may well want it as a backup planet the way to do that is not to build large football tents with air inside it's it's going to be fundamentally to grow, to build an to grow an atmosphere which is going to require a whole new set of microbes that will take basically the soil and, and the rocks on Earth and turn them into something of an atmosphere. Other, otherwise, it's, it's pretty much a non-starter. It's, it's a fixer-upper planet. Yeah. <laughs> but the great thing is also, as May said earlier, what we learn by so-called terraforming Mars, we can then bring back to Earth and re-terraform Earth. Here on Earth, Anytime you try to do anything interesting, you run into legitimate politics and issues about, well, if we make these guys warmer, these guys will get too hot. Mm -hmm. Mars is empty, so we can fool around with it and experiment, and uh, it's okay. extremely exciting. Well, so at SpaceX, how much of, of your business right now is focused on taking humans into space versus other commercial applications? The, uh, the the primary focus at this particular moment is there is twofold is to we, we flew the Falcon 9 uh, launch vehicle actually could I run my video yes you just can to give you guys some context well let me, let me just add should we let her run her video absolutely yes. <laughs>
for those of you, oh, yay. <laughs> I love our videos. So uh, for those of you that didn't know about SpaceX, this is what we're doing. Um, we're probably about 60-40 uh, focused on rockets versus capsules. And the capsules has both the recurring, we're obviously taking cargo to the International Space Station, but we're looking at upgrades to that capsule to be able to carry crew to the International Space Station as well. Um, and then the, the vehicles, the rocket side, uh, we're upgrading the Falcon 9 that you saw fly in the video. Um, we are upgrading that vehicle almost 50%. It'll carry about 50% more, uh, or the, the, the engine is about 50% bigger. Tanks are about 30% bigger. Um, so we're working on that upgrade, and then we're working at gluing, simple thing of gluing three of those together and turning that vehicle into the largest vehicle that's flown since the Saturn moon rocket, which is also pretty cool. So the last shuttle went up, I think, in 2011. So, but NASA hasn't stopped operating. That is correct. And they're your, they're your biggest customer, right? They are a large, single yes. largest customer, yes. Right. So, and basically, you were on the NASA advisory board. You know, what are some of the things that they're doing today that we don't hear about? Well, so. they're they're continuing to do research and they're continuing to look at Mars. the The challenge is. So much of what NASA is doing is decided by Congress every year with about actually six months behind. And so that, imagine a company where they regularly get beaten over the head. They're, the, for practical purposes, their biggest job is to employ people in the states in which the senators who give them money f have their voters. Uh, Sometimes the senators try and design the spacecraft or specify what they should be doing. And it's, it's extremely disheartening. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful organization, but it's, it's been kind of kicked. Let me, let me, I, I want to add I'm something. Let me, strong, do, let, me, let me do something with mm -hmm. this. I think one of the reasons there's sort of the malaise feel about NASA is because we've so much identified NASA with humans going into space and seeing the shuttle launch. As soon as the shuttle wasn't launching then, it sort of said, what is NASA doing? So the space station is still up there. One of the things that happened as a result of NASA was we were able to actually get commercial organizations to do some of the really hard work in getting to low Earth orbit and, and sort of really changing the access principles. Those are there. Everybody was riveted by Curiosity. Yes. Guess what? Curiosity was launched by NASA, the Hubble Space Telescope pictures. You hear about new planets being discovered, right? Now, I'm not with NASA anymore, haven't been for 20 years almost. but. I think it's important for us to recognize that there is still really incredible work going on. The fact that you don't see the big launches and the shuttle going off is sad. You can go visit at Elver Endeavor over at California Science Center. Um, but there is still really good work going on, and we still definitely need a governmental programs that do the hard work. So, for example, um, when I look at what we're doing with 100-Year Starship, by the way, we're not just the prelude, we're actually, it's important to get low Earth orbit. There are all these things that have to happen, and what we want to do is a rally for and promote those kinds of things that would happen, the capabilities that are needed. But if you step back for a second, there was a, start talking about the exotic kind of things, like warp engines and antimatter. There, some of the guys who are looking at warp are at NASA. They're doing that and they're looking at those kinds of things. Can we change space-time in some kind of way in order to get around Einstein's law that you can't go you know, faster than the speed of light? So, so it's not that NASA's yeah. gone. I think it's we, NASA's has not done as good of a job as reporting out what it's doing, but space exploration is still alive, but we do need a bold mission because that's what captivates imagination is when we can get people involved and they can see how yeah, eventually we might get to go. One of the things that NASA is okay. trying to do is much is to leverage that that the growing private sector. Private yeah. sector. You know, by the like the work that they have done with SpaceX, you know, to try to in a way that same seed dollars, if you will, to, to kick things going because, you know, you would not have had a customer, for example, for building the Dragon capsule if it wasn't that NASA recognized, hey, let's see if we can leverage this commercial market. And so NASA, to their credit, is actually getting more for their money 
Yeah. Actually the, went out on a limb yeah, in order to okay. do the commercial. There was a lot of criticism Absolutely. behind that and saying we're going to stop and we're going to do a commercial. And right. ironically, and for, for things that commercial can do. Ironically, a lot of the criticism came from Republicans. Uh, two other things NASA's doing. One, one is synthetic biology. They're they're doing a lot of research there, and they're they're doing the medical stuff. Finally, there's this whole issue around errant asteroids. Uh, I'm involved with the. B612 Foundation, which is their their mission is to discover asteroids heading towards Earth. And just as we were getting revved up, we actually had an unexpected asteroid hit us out in Siberia, as mm -hmm. you probably noticed. And at the same time, another asteroid flew by. Uh, unfortunately, NASA, which is aware of this issue, couldn't get funding to do the exploration which is what B612 is doing for about half a billion, which as founder Ed Liu, who's an astronaut also, says is about the amount you need for a nice hospital wing. Uh, if we do find such an asteroid, you can be sure the world is going to rely on NASA to go and just move it ever so slightly into a different orbit. And that's, I mean, that's life and death for everybody. And I want to put, I want to bring it back down to, to Earth a little bit. So we talked about in industry and things. So one of the most important things you can do from space is to image the Earth and do Earth observations. So you can actually, so there's a group at NASA called SEVERE that works on um, doing, using remote sensing for land management in developing countries and they've actually been building it in sort of like in Panama was the first country. Literally doing land management, They're, the people are trained up to do this and then they graduate, the country graduates from the course. NASA has been, Severe has been in Panama, it's working with USAID in um, Kenya and also in Nepal and actually setting up the capacity to use space-based technologies for remote sensing. So if people start looking at what kind of industries can we do, how can we commercially do this, imagine if people and farmers all around were actually using remotely sense, you know, remote sensing and imaging for management of crops and for building roads because you can do it in a uh, very, very easily. It's a very powerful technology. So sometimes we have to come back and look at it just a little bit different way. You know, of course, I was, I'm all for humans in space, obviously, but mm -hmm. there's so many different applications. There's so many different ways we can look at this. And as the technologies then roll out to things like using this imaging capacities for MRIs, right? So as we image our own body, you can use the same algorithms for that. So there are a lot of different ways that we can look at this. Don't vote for and, and tell your Congress folks you want space exploration to get more money. And I think the wonderful things that come out of it, for every seven dollars, uh, for every dollar that goes into NASA, seven more appear in the U.S. economy. It's kind of hard to beat. Yeah. But I think the important thing is that it, it's got to be, there's got to be a continuum as much as we can. There has to be that, that grand challenge that prompts the innovator, you know, to, to explore new areas and to recognize the unknowns unknowns that we need to find, that, you know, to think through the problem. But at the same time, if there isn't the kind of work like you just described that provides an opportunity for a market for the things that are coming. For example, you know, the environmental measurement, um, we've been doing this for decades from a, a military perspective, from a government perspective, but just the amount that it's now growing is now more folks that we will not have enough capacity on the instruments that are in space that the government is providing. So what will be the answer? Someone will ha start a company that will do environmental monitoring from space. And that means they'll be coming to Gwen to launch their their satellites <laughs> so that they It'll can have, so that they can, and so net, and that means she'll be looking to try to build her rockets cheaper and get more power, which means it'll feed back into this. So it's not, you can't just invest, you know, you, you've got to look at it as the entire spectrum. And I think that's what's going to bring us to space. That's what's going to bring us is that, because without that, um, market that provides an opportunity to make revenue 
um, you just there's just not enough money to mature everything without it. No, yeah, I, it's, I, it's, I was, it's, sorry. it's worth yeah. mentioning also making pharmaceuticals and, and other mm -hmm. kinds of manufacturing in zero G exactly. looks extremely promising. Uh, we will be mining asteroids for all kinds of rare, they'll no longer call them rare earths, uh, but there's, there's other stuff up there that will be commercially viable. Sorry. Uh, no, I was just going to say, I think one of the things that has to happen is we probably need to start scouring and really being more purposeful on the application and getting some of the incredible technologies that have been developed out there. So, for example, you heard about the shuttle and the tile. That's always, that was always an issue, right? But the tile was actually a phenomenal material that had about the weight of styrofoam. Mm -hmm. And yet it could bleed off incredible amount of heat in just this distance because on the other side of this there was a shuttle frame which was made out of aluminum. So you all of a sudden had to dissipate from about uh, 2,000 degrees to 400, less than 400 degrees. That's an incredible material. I'm sure that it can be used for lots of different things. That's the kind of piece that we haven't done when you start talking about space exploration because you know, we focus in on the rockets and the transportation and that's very much a part of our, our psyche and what, and what we do. But just to make these things happen, they're incredible systems that have to be developed. Mm -hmm. right. So basically you're telling me the efficiency. We all talk about, or people like to make fun of the government being so inefficient. But as you were saying a minute ago, NASA has become much more efficient mm -hmm. because they're contracting out to Gwen and possibly to others, but maybe just to Gwen. No, uh, more than there, are others. Yeah. But, there are others. She's got competition, but, which know, is good. And you know, and you know, I you sent me an article about the uh, disruptive challenges of mm -hmm. space, in which uh, you know you talked a lot about being much more efficient the way the the military. Right. Well, operates. well, here's as I mentioned, you know, the the space environment, to use the term broadly, that we live in today is very different than what it was even five years ago. Even five years ago, predominantly, um, most of the investment was coming from the government or governments, and most of the satellites that were on orbit were owned by a government entity. Um, and we had this national, international law that said we weren't supposed to do anything bad to each other, right? Well, now we look today, and we've had the Chinese demonstrate that they can inter they could destroy a satellite in space, which, by the way, creates all sorts of debris that is a danger to all of us because these things are traveling very, very fast. And, and if the space shuttle is up there or an international space station satellite. or one of my satellites gets hit by a piece of this junk from this, it's a dangerous situation. So the environment we live in now is, first of all, it's contested now. It's not like the wide open and I don't have to, which means that I've got, we've got to be able to talk to each other. We have to establish rules, just like we have navigation rules on the mm -hmm. sea. We need the similar rules in space. It is a competitive environment. Their um, Intelsat General is launching 78 different satellites in the next seven years. I'm doing about 25. I mean, that's a factor of three, more satellites that's launching. That's much more business. So what we're trying to do, the Air Force is trying to do, is how do I leverage that? So instead of going it alone all the time, one, are there international relationships that I can make so that I have international partners in what I do? Can I buy a commercially developed rocket instead of paying several billion dollars to develop one of my own? Um, so what we are trying to do, and we call it disruptive um, because it is disruptive. It's mm -hmm. not an evolutionary thing. We have to step back and look at how do I deal with a contested, competitive um, environment that has both opportunities and challenges. So instead of looking at it all and wringing my hands about what am I going to do about it? it's crowded up there, how do I leverage that? How do I leverage it? How do I take advantage of the commercial aspects? How do I take advantage of the fact that there really aren't any international borders in space? So, um, put up slide four for a second. You know, whether it's the um, companies that are going to be on the slide, they can put up a second, Gwen, or are others. I mean, I assume that there are there is competition out there. Yes, of course. Rocket, competition is good for business. Because it, obviously, it, and it helps everybody, <laughs> yep. right? Um, you know, and so are there other companies that are as far along as you are or that are coming along at that kind of rate? 
On the, uh, on the, the Dragon is the, the spaceship side. We're further along uh, than everybody else on that side. But clearly, we have lots of competitors in launch. The Chinese launch 19 times a year. Uh, Europe uh, and Ariane Spas launches between six and, and eight times per year. Uh, United Launch Alliance here domestically launches eight to 12 times per year. Orbital Sciences is mm -hmm. developing a new launcher called Antares. They just had their maiden test flight just a couple of weeks ago. So there's lots of competition for launch. Um, we are furthest along on the, on the, on the spaceship <coughs> side. Okay. And then there, there are also the other markets like the suborbital flights Correct. with both mm -hmm. X-Core and Virgin Galactic, um, there's... And Virgin just had a big success yes, yesterday. Right. Yesterday, yep. bless them. Mm -hmm. yep. And it, there's also, I'm an investor in a company called Nanorex, which offers basically retail space for your experiment. And you can, you can use Nanorex to help you get through the paperwork and the contracting details and so forth to get something ultimately up to, to space station. To do a ride share. Pardon? For a ride share. Yeah. We threw and some nanoracks on yeah. uh, on one of our missions to station. Yeah, it's um, and there's orbital outfitters. I mean, there's all kinds of other players. Bigelow, which right now the only place you can really go in space is the space station or possibly the moon. Bigelow's got a kind of floating hotel, mm -hmm. and he he ran what was it days in or. He had some budget suites of America. <laughs> so budget, right? So. I do want to so. chat a little bit about what Mr. Bigelow is trying to do. He um, he is a, a banker and a, and he owns a, a large chain of hotels. But these labs that he's creating uh, are really to advance science and exploration as well as business. Yeah. Um, this is technology uh, that he has purchased from NASA. Actually, he bought the patent, or he somehow bought the IP for that. It's really incredible. You, it's, it's fundamentally kind of a, um, a aluminum truss structure, and pedals of this system fold around it for launch because you got to be small. We don't build big enough fairings, apparently. And he gets on orbit, and then these pedals unfurl, and you get large habitats that are like twice the height of this room, but about the width, and maybe two thirds uh, of it this way. Uh, a huge tent. Really, yeah. if you were going to go camping, you could clearly go camping in space. I think, assuming uh, the the crew space transportation services industry goes the way it does, and you know, there's a number of providers uh, that move forward in the next competition that NASA is funding. Um, well, the taxpayers are funding. Um, I think uh, Mr. Bigelow will probably be the biggest consumer, single consumer of launch. I would, I would just, as as we're talking about this, so we I want to put it in the context, so because you had the slide up and how do we go out in the years. So there is the context and the continuum between having um, we, we, know, we, we know we can start to figure out low Earth orbit more efficiently, more effectively. And I think that's, that's in a, I would say, really close future. I mean, I don't mm -hmm. think it's that far away with the time and the commitment. We can do that, right? So what we have to figure out as a society, how do we continue moving on and how far do we push? <laughs> and I think the whole issue of what galvanizes us is thinking that we can do something more and something bigger. So, you know, clearly, you know, going to an asteroid probably doesn't sound as sexy as going to Mars, right? But going somewhere that's further out than the moon, somewhere that you could sort of establish your home. And then, you know, what we're doing, we're looking at, from 100 Year Starship, perspective is how do we support all that because we need the rah-rah for all of that those are the capabilities that will change our lives here on earth and then we want to go out and do precursor missions with small satellites so now you can do we think of when we think about going and um, in a planetary satellites we think of really big ones like curiosity and voyager but you can send things that's less that are less than a kilogram right and all of a sudden you start having this ability to do space exploration uh, having universities and other folks involved who couldn't do it before because you're yeah. working on big things you can have universities around the world and I think that that starts to gather the momentum and that's where we need to be and I think we start to look at it much more holistically rather than just singularly. So unfortunately the session is coming uh, to a you. close here. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all the panelists. We just have obviously scratched the surface today of what what is happening uh, I love the quote that you put up on slide number 15. 
that basically said we went to explore the moon and in fact discovered the earth. The fact is that everything we are doing in space and will do in the future will help us rediscover and make life better here for us all. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed the session as much as I have and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. And thank you for joining us.